Ranking the villains of the Dragon Ball manga sounds like an interesting idea, but quite a difficult one, when even some of the more minor ones have many interesting aspects about them, as you may know if you saw my far older three-part series on the Red Ribbon Army. Instead, I'll take the easier route of ranking those of the 13 Dragon Ball Z films in terms of their character, role, and other such qualities. It wouldn't be overly difficult to rank those of the Dragon Ball anime films and those of the super era, but it fits better to stick to the main 13 DBZ films when they are more easily comparable to each other in their structure and time period. Without further ado, let's go. When people talk about the film villains being cheap knockoffs of the main series, none is more worthy of that label than Slug. With the others, it may just be a premise or segment of their fights, but Slug copies 90% of the major beats of Piccolo Daimao, but with all the interesting motivations replaced with what's essentially a typical Mr. Freeze plot, well one of the versions without the tragic backstory, to the point he's just a we have this at home meme. Despite supposedly being the strongest person Goku had met at this point, which may or may not include Turles, he's a step down from Turles in every way, with the amount of injury he provides Goku to the additions to the regular Genkidama needed to defeat him. I questioned whether or not to include Kula's incarnations in the 5th and 6th films as the same, but the amount of his head and brain he seems to have lost in the latter film might as well make him a different person, especially when that lack of brain power causes the Meta Kula core to think it's a good idea to bring Goku and Vegeta into the heart of the Big Gete star when knowing not to underestimate Super Saiyans, and gets taken out in one of the most pathetic ways of anyone on this list. He at least avoids being a Mecha Freezer clone by putting up a fight against his opponents, and having a strength that can't be overcome with raw power, at least not at this point, along with the ability to use and counter Shunkan Ido, providing a lot to him that, unfortunately, wasn't expanded on, and he still ends up in what I'll call the stupid tier, in being defeated through several dozen points being taken taken off his IQ for the sake of wrapping up the film in the average runtime. Despite being the slow, Dr. Wiro is one of the more innovative villains in having been a mad scientist after Goku before we got that in the manga, and even showing how the power of Earth science can overcome some of the universe's strongest fighters before Gero too. What makes him fall so low is his motivation not making sense, despite his supposed intelligence. Yeah, I can understand him wanting to put his brain in an organic body if he wasn't so much of a literal big brain that his organ is near half as big as Goku's whole body. Not even Vegapunk's cranium is going to be able to host this. New material like Heroes giving him a more reasonably sized mechanical body almost seem like an apology for how little sense his film counterpart's plan makes. Now for the one everybody probably expected to be at the bottom, Bio Broly. He's definitely one of the most bland villains in the list when no more than an angry chemical monster, and a poor excuse to bring back Broly, and make him detached from anything Broly in the process. But he at least doesn't act far stupider than he should be like Wiro, and unlike Slug, he at least brings some new fins to the table in being defeated through a unique weakness that makes sense to his composition. A generic villain, but that's still better than being written as unreasonably stupid Next in the bland tier is Artificial Human 13. He really has nothing going for him beyond design when his whole character is following Gero's orders to kill Son Goku, and he becomes generic buff bad guy when transforming. Even if I were to count his dub characterization, which I'm not, his opinions there for a machine with no reason to be programmed with knowledge of human atrocities raises more questions than answers.
Much like Slug, Jananba carries the sin of being a watered-down copy of a main series villain, of course ripping off Boo's gimmick in two forms, even if Super Jananba is one of the coolest designs in the series. What separates the two is Jananba has some interesting lore attached to him, in and outside of the film, in being the personification of all the universe's evil, and video games alluding to him being an avatar of a great figure in the Makai. Unfortunately, all these grandiose ideas are sidelined for what's essentially a fight against Boo 2.0, but without the parallels to Goku to make the latter meaningful, with even more tertiary entries like heroes not fulfilling the vast potential to make Genenba great. Bojack is another villain people would think of when the phrase bland DBZ film villain is said. It's unfortunate when his background revealed in video games gives his crew some parallels to the Scions on Earth they fight, as the last survivors of their respective race, in this continuity at least, and he separates himself from the average Planet Buster fans in being the average Earth enjoyer as well as being one of the first space pirates in the franchise, removed from the aesthetics of Frieza's forces, but that's pretty much all that separates him from any other Diamond Dozen Galactic Conqueror, trying to one-up Frieza's family. Despite having gone over how bad the Garlic Jr. mini-arc was, those who saw that video may remember the praise I provided his film incarnation. His motive of wanting to avenge his father, along with being the only villain until Zamasu to gain immortality outside of what-ifs, make him both arguably the most sympathetic and successful film villain. Unfortunately, there's the snag in his plan of his henchman targeting Piccolo, which would have unwittingly thwarted his plans, if they'd been any stronger. I'd guess he was aware they'd only be strong enough to keep him out of commission at best, but it's still a huge risk for one of the more methodical film villains, though not as awful as him not learning his mistake in his filler return. His decision to open the dead zone and lead to his defeat, rather than just wait for Goku and Piccolo to wear themselves down, is a silly decision preventing him from being ranked higher. For someone whose name is partially based on the word cooler, though not entirely contrary to popular belief. Kula lives up to his name, by being nowhere near as ice-cold as Frieza, who is a contender for best villain in the franchise, whereas Kula's personality is what happens when you strip away all the mannerisms and nuances from Frieza's character, and turn him into the typical, oh I'm the strongest now let me just waste time messing about with you because you'll never, oh. This is the one thing we we didn't want to happen. He desires to actually fight the Super Saiyan rather than prevent someone from becoming one, but that doesn't really cut it in helping him escape Frieza's shadow. The sad thing is, there's enough tidbits in other sources to turn Kula into one of the best villains in not just the films, but the franchise in general, if combined. Material like heroes playing up his ambition of outdoing Frieza, as well as only Frieza and Cold being noted to be natural prodigies of their species in any source, as well as Sousa having gone from someone who Ginyu could rival to holding his own against post Namek Piccolo, make Kula and his armoured squadron, those who have achieved their power and position through hard work like Goku, along with being an inversion of Vegeta's mindset of surpassing Kakarotto. Unfortunately, this parallel isn't played into at all in his debut film, and calls Kula's potential to be the one thing keeping him this high. Hirdegan has no personality, and that's okay with the role it has in its film's narrative. As a driving force of inner conflict for Tapion, and being the series' first attempt at a kaiju, not counting the Ozaru which were described in their debut as kaibutsu, doing so far better than a later attempt. They also add a lot more world building to the series through their background than the typical film villain, in being a demon god worshipped on Con 
Nuts, who drew impurities into itself, before being corrupted into a Genmajin, or Phantom Demon, by sorcerers. See, Janemba, it isn't too hard to be an evil embodiment with Boo parallels without being a ripoff. On top of that, their role as the inner demon Tapion struggles with provides far more nuance in his film's plot than perhaps any other of these films. They don't have more than a cool mist technique going for them beyond that, but when most of the film villains range from knockoffs to generic, that's more than enough to justify his placement. I've often brought up Turles as an example of a vapid evil Goku, who doesn't add any depth to the parallel. And that's still true when his whole premise is boiled down to one sentence at the end of the film, and isn't anything Raditz or Vegeta didn't do better. It's when looking past the generic take on the evil Goku idea, that we see traits that allow him to stand above those on the list already mentioned. He acts far more tactically, and the efficiently than them, in turning the power ball on and off, along with not wasting time fighting Goku unprepared, when miscalculating Kakarotta's strength, and him making up for his lower class genes by eating what's essentially godly fruit, not only being the one subtle tie to Goku's origins, in parallel in Sun Ukan, stealing and eating the peaches of immortality from the heavens, but separates him from the majority of villains that view themselves as naturally superior. There's also a lot of interesting lore tidbits attached to him, such as his reputation before leaving Frieza's army, his role as a space pirate, and how the background provided to his henchmen and supplementary material fleshes out the setting far more than all ranked below him, other than perhaps Kula. Though failing in his initial premise, Turles has enough going on for him outside of that to be one of the better handled of these lot. By process of elimination, you know Broly is here. There will be some saying, the guy who hated Goku for crying over the rest, to which I say, that's not why he hates Goku. I'd recommend the video by Lonely Boy Adventurer for misconceptions about Broly's reaction. Though the short version is, Saiyans with great connection to their culture can instinctually sense a threat from their species. Broly did so when communicating with Kakarot in the only way two newborns could, and his characterization in the 10th film, where he does become obsessed with this, makes sense with the PTSD that had come from his fears becoming reality when taking a severe wound to the abdomen. That aside, Broly has what others in this list have lacked. His character and background are entirely his own. He has a fleshed out personality in his legendary Super Saiyan form, with witty remarks, a distinct fight and style, and unique ways of torment in his inferiors, along with having dynamic changes in his arc that add tragedy in him being degraded into being one-dimensional through his fear and suffering. His role adds more to the series lore, in exploring the Super Saiyan's role as both a legend and mutation, packaged in what's the antithesis of the ones we've come to know, in being primal destructive Saiyan power incarnate, emphasised by a lack of pupils symbolising the subconscious. It's no surprise Broly has not only been integrated into the new continuity, but has endured as an icon of the franchise. Thank you if having watched through this ranking. If having a different order, simply comment it below. Be sure to check out my Dragon Ball analyses if new to the channel, and I'll see you next time.